Well, good morning. As you notice, I'm not Kenny. <laughs> so don't worry. Just come back next Sunday. He'll be back. Um, last week, while I was sitting in Kenny's message, he had said something that stuck out to me. And uh, something that really made it stick out even more was that Sarah and I, that morning, had made a uh, commitment to each other that we were going to do a technology freeze for the day. So we left our phones in the bedroom and um, didn't look on Facebook or anything all day. But during the message, Kenny said that Jesus came to start a relationship, not a religion. And they just stuck to me. And I said, well, I think I know what God wants me to speak about today. Uh, it wasn't until Monday morning I woke up and then, you know, the ritual of getting on Facebook. Um, I see Jesse's post from the day before of that exact same message. And that was all it said. So I was like, well, that, that's exactly what you want, God. Um, if we look at our mission statement for the church, it states, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation, and then to lead uh, and to disciple people to spiritual maturity and equip them for ministry. Anytime that we uh, do things here at Solid Rock, we take a look back at what is that mission statement and how do the things that we do here um, relate to that mission statement. Back in January, I spoke about um, how to disciple people or what, why discipleship's important within our congregation. Well, then this morning, I felt the need to talk about the relationship with Jesus Christ. I, left, I put some notes in your bulletin, uh, no fill in the blanks though, so if you just want to doodle and scribble all over that, go right ahead. But it'll also help me keep track of where I'm at. Um, the first place I'm going to look into is in Matthew. Um, we're going to look at some different, um, I guess, versions of why Jesus Christ came and whose point of views those were from. So the very first one that I want to look at is from Joseph's point of view. Um, that's in Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. So this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You see, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So that, that was one point of view of the story, and... Um, you can imagine the fear, the, uh, the misunderstanding, or the, the confusion inside Joseph's heart whenever uh, he finds out first that Mary's pregnant, and it, he, they weren't married yet, so it wasn't his. Um, the, there was some turmoil going on there inside him until the angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him and, and expressed why, why this was happening. Well, now we'll look at Mary's side of the story. And we'll look at that in Luke 1, um, verse 26 through 38 tells um, how the story came about from her side. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledge to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Verse 31 starts now. You will conceive and give birth to a son. 
and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am just a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word for the God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Can you imagine how terrified this young girl must have been? How was she going to explain to Joseph that she was carrying the Son of God? How was she going to tell her friends? How was she going to tell her family? All that she could do was believe, believe in what the angel had told her. Um, and then she, you also had the story in there of Elizabeth and um, the, the pregnancy of John the Baptist in there as well. Um, so there was two miracles going on at the same time there. You had John the Baptist being born and conceived from um, people that were uh, believed to not be too old to have children. Um, and then John was coming to proclaim Jesus Christ, proclaim his love to, to get people ready for Jesus' coming. Now if we look at the shepherd's point of view. So you had these uh, shepherds off to, you know, that they were just out in the field doing what they do, watching their flock. Um, as they're there, and this is in Luke 2, verses 8 through 20. Also, I, I need to point out that whenever I first had thought about this, this message was going to be about the relationships that we have with each other. And I was thinking, well... The three wise men, imagine the relationship that they had with each other as they were going on this journey to, um, to see Jesus Christ, to see the, the, the new leader. Um, we, we have relationships with everyone here, and we're called to, to build these relationships, and we're to do this by having life together, and that's what the wise men were doing. But then what struck me as odd was that the Bible never said there was three wise men. <laughs> I was all over this thing looking for that. But they said there was th three gifts, but there could have been... 15 wise men that came. So then my mind was just blown that, um, that it's just a relationship story is all it is. The numbers of how many wise men there were isn't important. The idea of when Jesus' birth actually was, was it actually on December 25th? It's not important. What is important is that his birth was and did take place. And these shepherds were getting this from this angel. And it says, And there were shepherds living on the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Verse 11 states, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. A Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in the manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth to those of whom his favor rests. What I picture here is that there was an angel that was coming to tell the, the shepherds, Hey, there, there's, you're not going to believe what's going to happen here. Your Savior is being born tonight. But then there's this whole choir of angels, like, busting. They can't contain it anymore. They're like, they just bust out and say, glory to God in the highest heaven. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, 
glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The entire world is told of the coming of Jesus Christ and his purpose. This is the one that affects all of us. This is the one that John wrote, to not to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, not to the Romans. He wrote this to everyone, to each and every one of us. In John 1, Verse 9 through 13, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Right there, John's telling us that he came for each one of us, not, not because we were born into a certain religion, not because we were born Amish or Catholic or Jewish. It doesn't matter. He came for each and every one of us. I had most of this written out earlier in the week, and I was sitting down with Mike, actually, on Tuesday night, and I told him, hey, I, I think we're ready. And he goes, nah, it'll change before then. And I said, no, no, I'm prepared. I think, I think we're ready. Um, yesterday it changed. <laughs> Just a little bit, a little tweak. And then this morning it really changed because um, I, I was reading and listening to something, and, and it really touched my heart. And I went to go edit what my notes were. And apparently, I didn't save my notes that I had done yesterday. <laughs> so I had to do it based off of the bulletin that I had printed off. And I also shredded my, my other notes that I had. Um, so it's funny how we kind of work this way. But I hope that my message today uh, touches you just like it's touched me, because it's not my message, it's God's message. Um, and the other, you know the other things that, that kind of get you distracted on Sunday mornings? So we, we get up in the morning. Um, first off, we have a four-year-old boy. You guys know Will. He comes into our bedroom, I think at 3 o'clock in the morning, at 4 o'clock in the morning. And at one of those times, he decided to lay in between us. So there, there was this H thing going on between me and Sarah, sideways and kicking. We, we tell him to go to bed, and he says, you'll have nightmares in his bed. And I'm like, go have nightmares on the couch. <laughs> um, I found him on the couch this morning, actually, whenever I got up. But this was after Joshua comes to us at 6 this morning with his iPad all bright, and I told him to go away. And he goes, no, this is really important. And he shines it in Sarah's face and says, I've been selected for $1,000. <laughs> Isn't it funny how the disruptions, though, are just blessings in our lives. So then I'm also looking at, well, what am I going to wear today? I should have thought about that beforehand because I'm not used to wearing nice shirts or anything, really. Uh, so finding a pair of pants that still fit me was a little ridiculous. Um, apparently my waist size has gotten a little larger. Or all my pants have shrunk. I believe it's the second. And then I couldn't find a white T-shirt. <laughs> so then I was worried about what T-shirt was I going to wear. And actually, um, through this, you can probably see the Nakatamali. Through, through, my, through my shirt. So just another distraction. So along with that, getting, um, you know, getting all the distractions of trying to wake up and then trying to get the message ready and then shredding the message that you had on accident, um, it still came to me that Christianity is not a religion. And that's, what, that's what he kept trying to say. All these things that were happening to me this morning, um, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's all fun. It's all uh, us to, to take a part in. It's, all, it's the relationship that we have with all these weird things that happen. By the way, Josh did not get $1,000. <laughs> Christianity is not a religion. 
It is a relationship that God has established with his children. The Bible states clearly that there is nothing man can do to make himself right with God. God did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Our sin separates us from his presence, and sin must be punished. But because God loves us, he took our punishment upon himself. All we must do is accept God's gift of salvation through faith. Grace is God's blessing on this understanding. The grace-based relationship between God and man is the foundation of Christianity. The established religion was one of the staunchest opponents of Jesus Christ during his early ministries, earthly ministries. So when God gave his laws to the Israelites, his desire was that they love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Love. Love speaks of relationship. Obedience to all the other commands had to stem from a love of God. We were able to love him because he loved us first. All those rules and regulations didn't mean anything if it wasn't done out of love. If you just did them because it was all written in the Bible, it, it's worthless. And you, you recognize this whenever Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. The obedience to the commands, though, has stemmed from a love for God. And that's why we try to follow, and that's why we follow what the Word of God says. However, by Jesus' time, the Jewish leaders had made a religion out of God's desire to live in a love relationship with them. Over the years, they had perverted God's law into a works-based religion that alienated people from him. Then they added more of their own rules to make it even more cumbersome. They prided themselves on their ability to keep the law, at least outwardly, and lorded their authority over the common people who could never keep such strenuous rules. The Pharisees failed to recognize God himself when he was standing right in front of them. Jesus Christ was right in front of them, and they couldn't recognize that. They had chosen their religion over their relationship. Entire dominations have followed the way of the Pharisees now in creating rules not found in Scripture. Some who profess following Christ are actually following man-made religion in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to go through here and name those denominations, but we've all been to these places before. We've all um, probably came from different churches, different uh, families that believed in this religion and not this relationship. It's the man-made rules that have separated us from that relationship, from that love that God had for us. While claiming to believe Scripture, they are often plagued with fear and doubt that they may not be good enough to earn salvation or that God will not accept them if they don't perform to a certain standard. This is a religion masquerading as Christianity, and it's one of Satan's favorite tricks. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 23, 1 through 7, when he rebuked the Pharisees instead of pointing the people to heaven. These religious leaders were keeping people out of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Holiness and obedience to Scripture are important, but they're evidence of a transformed heart not means to attain that transformed heart. God desires that we be holy as he is holy. But he wants us to grow in the grace and knowledge of him. But we do these things because we are his children and want to be like him, not, not in order to earn his love. We cannot earn his love. We have his love already. But it's because that we recognize this. That's why we want to do these things. Not all the religious rules and regulations to follow Christianity is not about signing up for a religion. Christianity is about being born in the family of God, as stated in John 3.3. 3. It is a relationship. God wants us to know him, to draw near to him, to pray to him, and to love him above everything. This is not religion. This is a relationship. He doesn't want us 
to do these man-made rules. And that's all that a lot of the things that, that happen that we see in um, these staunch opponents of, of what we're doing in life and, and not following. And He wants us to follow the Word of God. He does, because sin cannot be in His presence. But He doesn't want us to think that we do that, we check everything off that, and now we've gained His favor. We've already gained His favor, and He loves us, and because of that love, we want to do what we're supposed to do. Now then the biggest question is, how do we even begin this relationship? How do we, how do we become a child of God? Must be a Cubs fan. <laughs> Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Revelation 3.20, Revelation written by John, the last book of the Bible. Jesus tells them, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Whenever we eat with other people, we, we do it because of a relationship that we've gained with each other. We don't do it because, again, because, you know, the religious sect tells us that that's what we're supposed to do. We do it because we're friends with you, we're friends with you, we're family with you. That's why Jesus is saying there, that, that's what he's saying. He's like, just open up, open up your door, I'm going to knock, just let me in. There's nothing else that you have to do. Once you do, once you let me in, you'll feel the love. And then, read my word, and follow my word. Don't misconstrue my words, don't misconstrue the word of God into saying what you want it to say. That's again why I also state, never take what I say as the gospel, because you have the gospel in front of you. You have the gospel underneath every one of the seats here. You have to read the word of God. And once you do and you open it up and you let it talk to you, you'll see that God loves you more than anything in the world. So much so, he could have started over. There are several times where he could have just said, I'm, I'm done with this crazy race of earthlings. Let's get rid of them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who I am. They don't understand me. It would have been so easy. But God loves us. So much so that he gave his only son. And a lot of times we, we, you know, when you think about that, or even, even if you think about giving your life for somebody, um, you'd give your life for a family member. I, I guarantee every, every person in here would do that, would give their life for a family member that they love. I think that a majority would give their life for a friend in here. But to give your life for people that hate you and despise you, I don't think anybody in here would do that. But that's what our Lord did. And he, he wants that relationship with us. He, he gave so much to us that he just wants that relationship. If you're here this morning and you're not sure about that relationship, or you're not sure where you're at with God on it, we're going to have prayer teams in the front and the back. Um, come up and have a talk. Pray to God. Pray with them. They'll help you with that conversation. Um, again, we're going to have prayer teams set up as well. So if you have hurts in your life, hurts that you need prayers for right now, please come and see them. If you have rejoices, if you have things that you're so happy for that you just need to thank God for them, come and see them. We shouldn't just be using the prayer team for things that, that were hurt over. We should be using them as well to praise God for the wonderful things in our lives. We have so much to be thankful for. And each and one of you, each and every person in here is something I am so thankful for. So whenever uh, 
when, whenever we start the, the worship music, um, the prayer teams will, will come to the front. I didn't warn anybody of this, so <laughs> I hope you're ready. <laughs> um, again, we just, I just thank each and every one here this morning. Um, this is really all I have, is that God sent Jesus Christ to earth to build a relationship with each and every one of you. He didn't send them down here to start a religion. They already had that. That didn't work. It was that personal relationship that he sent his son for. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your relationship. I thank you for each and every person here this morning. I thank you for the love that you've shown us. I thank you for the people that are rejoicing. I thank you for the people that are hurting. I thank you for the people that are laughing and crying. We just thank you for sending your son to build that relationship with us. We thank you so much that we don't have to rely on religion. We don't have to rely on how many tasks that we complete or how much better we are how good we are compared to how bad we are. If that was the case, I would never get to see your face. I'm thankful for you. Looking forward to the day that I can sing and rejoice with you and the loved ones that are ahead of me. Again, God, thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.